Hey lore lovers, my name's Eric with the Lorebrarians YouTube channel. With the upcoming release of Midnight Hunt, I thought now would be the perfect time to introduce a new series called Finding Flavor, a set review of Midnight Hunt. New magic sets, their accompanying articles, and story archives paint vibrant pictures of what the essence of the sets are and their locales. And we spend a great deal of time on this channel exploring tales, settings, and characters in fine detail. But with hundreds of cards printed in each set, with dozens of flavor text and innumerable pieces of art, many of them miss their chance in the spotlight and fall through the cracks without our lens passing over them. So today, we're taking some time to revisit these forgotten stories and tidbit treasures as we go through a set review of the upcoming Innistrad Midnight Hunt. Unlike other set reviews by content creators, Finding Flavor won't focus on which cards are the best, what new commanders to run, or which new removal spell is the most efficient, but rather on reviewing the flavor of the set as a whole and uncovering small pieces of lore that tie the cards together to create a living, breathing, planner setting in MTG's vast multiverse. But before we begin, if you're a fan of lore and storytelling, or if Magic the Gathering is dear to you, consider subscribing to the channel where lore videos are uploaded frequently. And if you'd like to help the channel further, I've recently launched a Patreon page with various reward tiers, and I truly appreciate the support. Alright, time to sharpen our stakes and bless our silver as we break down the set of Midnight Hunt. Let's dive in. I'd like to start with some flavorful cards that aren't necessarily central to the story or world building of Innistrad, but that call back to previous cards printed in Innistrad sets. There are several cards in Midnight Hunt that harken to the past, sometimes directly and sometimes subtly. The first is Triskaidekaphile. This card is a call to Triskaidekaphobia, a four mana black enchantment printed in Shadows over Innistrad. Both cards have everything to do with the number 13, including win or lose conditions, power and toughness, and depictions of 13 in the art. What's interesting is when combined, their mana cost of 1 in a blue and 3 in a black equal 13. Next up are the cards Faithless Looting and Faithful Mending. Faithless Looting, printed in the original Innistrad block, shows us what happens to humanity when its guardian suddenly vanishes. We see peasants burning down a church and looting its stores. The flavor text reads, Avacyn has abandoned us. We have nothing left except what we can take. Faithful Mending, however, shows us what's possible when faith is renewed. It depicts individuals restoring a derelict church, no doubt the one burned down, and its flavor text calls to faithless looting. What has been looted can be restored. The church lives on within us. A flavorful tact is that both draw two cards and discard two cards, and both have flashback. The next pair of flashback and throwbacks are the cards Champion of the Parish and the newly printed Champion of the Perished. Besides being a great play on words, these two cards are very nearly the same. The Perisher gets plus 1-1 one, one counters when humans ETB and the Perished gets plus 1-1 one, one counters for zombies ETBing. But the most flavorful aspect of these cards comes in their respective flavor texts. The Parish states, I stand for every cobbler, tanner, and fool in this town, and they stand for me. Whereas the Perished reads, He rose from the graff for every cobbler, tanner, and fool who'd been slaughtered in the Parish, and they rose and shambled after him. Up next is another nice flavor win in the card Croaking Counterpart, and it's, well, Counterpart, Cackling Counterpart. This is another great play on words, and we can see that both cards create tokens of creatures, and both have a flashback cost. The only difference is that Croaking Counterpart is a frog, which may or may not be a downside. Finally, we have the card Avacyn's Memorial, and its namesake, Avacyn Angel of Hope. 
Both of these cards have the same casting cost of five white, white, white. Both are indestructible, and both grant indestructibility to other permanents. It appears that Avacyn, although corrupted and unmade, continues to inspire faith and devotion in those of the plane. The depiction of Avacyn in her memorial is the same pose that she's striking in the art of her original card. And now, it's time to visit some of the legendary creatures and important characters that are getting some love in Midnight Hunt. Our first character is a necromancer, a ghoul caller from the coastal province of Nephalia that's been mentioned in the flavor text of many cards, but is now finally receiving a printing of his own. The dastardly and devious Jadar, ghoul caller of Nephalia. The province is notable for its stitchers and necromancers who patrol the various graphs in search of zombies to raise and scabs to bring back to life. Jadar is a master amongst ghoul callers, and his words have appeared in the flavor text of cards like Ghoul Razor, Nephalia Drownyard, and Walking Corpse. His skills are enough to raise entire armies of ghouls and zombies, and he uses them for his own personal ambitions no doubt gaining clout amongst his fellow necromancers along the way. Tovalar, dire overlord, is leader of the Mondronan pack of werewolves and represents the main antagonist in Midnight Hunt. His howl pack are fueled and strengthened by the increasing power of the moon and the lengthy nights befalling Innistrad. This is told to us in the flavor text of Foul Play, which depicts the Cathar investigation of a crime scene. The text reads, The evidence was overwhelming. Tovalar's Halpak was getting bolder, smarter, and stronger. We see both his and his Halpak's strength grow in cards like Moonrager's Slash and Unnatural Growth. What's interesting is that Tovalar was first mentioned in the original Innistrad block, in the flavor text of Mundrone and Shaman, and in the flip side of the same card as the shaman transforms into Tovalar's mage hunter. He's as devious and crafty as he is brutish. His Halpak was responsible for sacking Averbrook, the old provincial seat of Keswick, and raising it so all that remained was the haunted shell of a town called Hollowhenge. And again, we see his genius mentioned in the card Lamholt Harrier. Here we see a wolf unleashed in the streets of Lamholt, terrorizing the population and weakening resolve. The flavor text states, This Tovalar is no brainless brute. He sends his howling minions to terrorize a village for months. Sleepless nights and fear take their toll. Only then, when morale is at its worst, does he strike. He and his wolves are responsible for the attack on the Celestis during the Harvest Tide Festival. Up next is a character that's been printed twice already in past Innistrad sets, but that's making a bright return. The final remaining Archangel Sigarda, Champion of Light. Sigarda and her flight are the last remnants of angels on Innistrad, those that survived Eldritch Moon with both their lives and their sanity. They remained true to the humans in the darkest hours, and they continued to protect humanity still, to see them through the lengthening nights. The host of herons stands in Avacyn's stead as a beacon of hope and prayer, gathering wayward souls and once more instilling purpose within them. We see this in the card Bereaved Survivor, where an individual mourns Avacyn's death with resignation. The flavor text reads, With Avacyn gone, I no longer knew who to pray to. Alone, I wept for a sister who would never return. We see her transformation on the flip side in the card Dauntless Avenger. The survivor no longer wallows in pity, but has taken up the sword to bring justice to the world. The text reads, It was Sigarda who lifted me from despair and gave me the strength to fight on. We see Sigarda mentioned or depicted again in cards like Sigarda's Splendor and Sigardian Savior, which highlights the angel's use of blinding light to cast out the shadows and protect humanity. The card Flare of Faith 
shows us how powerful belief in the host of herons can be, as a priest invokes divine retribution and turns back a sea of advancing werewolves. The text of this card states, I fell to my knees, I called out to Zagarda, and then I saw my tormentors blaze with blessed sunlight. Sagarda's title may hearken to the Celestis, the unbalanced dichotomy of night and day, and Light's stalwart defense against the encroaching darkness. Like Jadar of Nephalia, the next character has been mentioned in the flavor text and illustrated in the art of many cards throughout Innistrad sets, but who is just now receiving his very own printing. The fearsome blade of the Inquisitors turned Angel and Eldrazi Slayer, Rem Carolus who now acts as humanity's most fervent and stalwart slayer of all manner of lurking monsters. Rem was a character introduced in the first Innistrad block as one of the most zealous inquisitors in the Church of Avacyn. These soldiers tracked down werewolves and vampires hiding amongst humans, destroyed Stitcher's laboratories, and arrested ghoul callers. Rem was at the fore, the proverbial monster slayer of Innistrad, and he executed his missions perfectly. In the art and flavor text of Demolish, we see him obliterating a Skaberin's lab. It reads, To truly defeat a Skaberin, you must destroy not the monster, but the lab. We hear him again in Guise of Fire, stating that, Fire will eventually destroy a zombie, but a fiery zombie destroys a lot of other things first. He seems to be on a quest for destruction because there's another card where he mentions blowing things up in one way or another. The flavor text of Dismantling Blow, he repeats Avacyn's mantra. What cannot be destroyed will be bound. Then he adds on, but do try to destroy it the first time. Clearly, he has a preference for destruction. So far, all mentions of Carolus have been as a blade of the Inquisitors, but that changes with the madness of Avacyn and the coming of Emrakul in Shadows over Innistrad. Here, Rem's unshakable faith in his church actually comes into question. Upon learning of the corruption and transformation of both the Angelic Host and the Lunar Council, Rem renounces the institution he once fought for, turning his skills now against the angels he often battled alongside. Here, he becomes Rem Carolus, Slayer of Angels, and Eldrazi. We can read this in the flavor texts of Clear Shot and Slayer's Cleaver, which bestow onto Rem these monikers. In the aftermath of the travails and the encroaching darkness of Midnight Hunt, Rem finally gets his own printing as a stalwart slayer. His zeal for rooting out evil has never wavered, and Rem frequently acts as a one-man army, a monster slayer, that brings the fight directly to his foes, vanquishing them with holy fire on the back of his hippogriff. Our next character is the demonic overlord Ormondal. First mentioned in the card Westvale Abbey, where the Skirstag cultists of Westvale sought a new demon to worship after the destruction of Grizzlebrand. The profane prince filled the void left over with his death and has assumed the mantle of greatest demon on Innistrad. In Midnight Hunt, with the advancement of evil forces, the Skirstag ranks have swelled. We see their devotion and worship of Ormondal in cards like Bladebrand and Blood Pact, where cultists perform blood rituals and sacrifice to beckon forth their demonic overlord. Blood Pact's flavor text clues us in on the recent events. It states, Grizzlebrand's defeat did not mark the end of the Skirstag cult. They simply turned their worship to the next demon to emerge from the shadows, bearing offers of power. In the cards Ecstatic Awakener and Jaren Corrupted Bishop, the influence of the Skirstag and the temptation demons offer is beautifully illustrated. On the reverse side of the cards, we see what fate ultimately awaits those loyal to Innistrad's demons. Agony betrayal, and eternal damnation. The final legendary we're going to mention is one that definitely took me and I'm sure many others by surprise. Liesa, Forgotten Archangel. 
Liesa is the sister of Bruna, Sigarda, and Gisela, one of Innistrad's first archangels that predated even Avacyn. Liesa led Flight Dusk, the angelic host responsible for understanding and dealing with monsters in order to save humanity from the worst of them. They frequently colluded with demons, ancient beings, and all manner of terrors, striking deals to protect their human flock. What's surprising is that Liesa and all of Flight Dusk were supposedly eradicated by Avacyn long ago for allying with the angel's sworn enemy. Her name and her flight were stricken from the histories, leaving her the forgotten archangel. So why is it that she's still alive and well, printed in Midnight Hunt? Perhaps Liesa had learned from Innistrad's demons how to preserve her essence. After all, the demons of the plane can't truly be destroyed. Maybe Avacyn and her magic kept Liesa from manifesting, and with Avacyn's death, the forgotten sister could once more return whole to her native plane. And now I'd like to briefly mention the story spotlight cards of the set, and that I won't be going over them in this video. The spotlight cards are purposefully made to share the lore and pivotal moments of the story and they'll make a prominent appearance in part two of The Plane of Innistrad Explained, where I'll discuss the entire history and storyline of the plane. Since they're pushed to be in the spotlight by wizards, I won't discuss them here. The ancient ritual of Harvest Tide is featured prominently throughout the set. It's a thanksgiving to the old gods for their protection, for their grace in allowing humanity to witness another year on the plane. The Harvest Tide Festival is illustrated or referenced in many cards, and the coven of witches that lead it inspire hope, cast a ray of light on the grim present, which is witnessing the shortening of days and the strengthening of Innistrad's abominations. Harvest Tide traditions predate Avacyn, and those that participate worship a god named Grin Danu. We hear the god's name mentioned in the flavor text of Return to Nature, in which Catilda leader of the Dawnheart Coven says, Even steel and stone return to Grindanu in time. And Catilda's own card has a quote from her referring once more to the god. The angels may have abandoned us, but Grindanu has not. The Dawnheart Coven stand as leaders and protectors of the sacred Harvest Tide Festival, a festival that is symbolically connected to light. We see the power of light and candles on display in cards like Candle Grove Witch, Candle Trap, and Sunset Revelry. With humanity's faith in their angelic hosts destroyed, and with them facing uncertain times, we can understand how Harvest Tide can act as a symbol of renewed faith. And indeed, many Cathars, citizens, and villagers place their belief firmly with the Dawnheart Coven and their ritual. But is it enough? There are many cards that paint a picture of the grim reality the forces of light face. And there's a common theme across the set that Innistrad's lunar cycle is changing, likely due to Emmercroll's imprisonment, and the forces of darkness are growing stronger. Cards like Firmament Sage and Mysterious Tome tell us that Innistrad's nights are lengthening far more than in any autumn past and that humanity's fate is sealed. The countryside was captured in the icy grip of winter and darkened by eternal night. Then cards like Unnatural Growth and Dire Strain Rampage showcase the effects a changing moon has on the werewolves of the plain. They grow fiercer and far more aggressive in their destruction. In whole, the aura of danger and uncertainty that plagues Innistrad can be succinctly stated in the flavor text of Evolving Wilds, in which Catilda says, Stencia blazes with new heat, Nephalia's tides are chaotic, and everywhere, this unnatural frost. The land is sending a warning. This next topic is quite short but worth mentioning, and that's the appearance of sun gold in the lore. In Innistrad's past, Moon Silver has been mentioned several times. Both the Moon and Silver hold a special place in superstition and religion, 
due to their use against the unnatural monsters that plague the plain. We can see this in cards like Moon Silver Spear and Bound in Moon Silver. Midnight Hunt introduces an opposing but complementary force named Sun Gold. As an effective weapon wielded by the Dawnheart Coven, Sun Gold likely predates Avacyn as a tool used to fight back the darkness. We can see it mentioned in the titles of cards like Sun Gold Sentinel and Sun Gold Barrage. The two likely work in tandem as the Moon Silver Key and Sun Gold Lock are needed to restore balance between night and day. Now, let's talk about the Travails. This name is given to the tumultuous period during Shadows over Innistrad, when Avacyn, her angelic host, and many other creatures became corrupted by Emrakul, and when the Eldrazi were released on the plane due to the machinations of Nahiri the Lithomancer. This was a traumatic and damaging event for the survivors. They had to watch as their angelic protectors turned on them, as their friends and neighbors succumbed to madness and as their villages transformed before their eyes into twisted mockery of natural life, becoming instead Eldrazi abominations. They then found themselves in a fight for survival against such abominations, relying on brutal and experimental weaponry to save the day. The Travails are mentioned in the online magic story articles, but they are also referenced in two cards from Midnight Hunt. The first is Geist Wave, and the flavor text reads, Necroalchemists gained popular support during their travails, when Geist-fueled weapons helped defend towns against mad cultists and Eldrazi monstrosities. The art of the card shows such a weapon in use against one of Innistrad's werewolves. The second mention comes in the flavor text of Clear Shot, which mentions the spike in werewolf activity and the events of the current set. It reads, As werewolf attacks increased, brutal weapons not seen since the travails were dusted off and put to work. Massive arbalests and cleavers, along with countless other weapons, saw wide use during the Eldrazi invasion of Innistrad. Which brings us to another point. One thing Midnight Hunt left out that I think was a missed opportunity is that there really isn't any mention of Eldrazi or Emrakul in the fallout of Shadows over Innistrad. We know that many believe Emrakul's presence in the moon to be what's causing the shift in balance between night and day, but there's not any mention of her, nor is there a remnant of the Eldrazi's presence, either a grotesque and horrific beast, twisted in unnatural dimension, or a mind shattered by the Eldrazi's touch. It's almost as if the events of Shadow over Innistrad didn't happen. We get mention of them only in the flavor text of the Travails, or in the cards that mention Sigarda's uncorrupted resolve, such as Dauntless Avenger and Kyler, Sigardian Emissary, whose flavor text reads, Even when the angels succumbed to madness, Sigarda stood strong. She is hope. It appears werewolves aren't the only monsters changing the rules of engagement with humanity, as Innistrad slips once more towards darkness. No doubt a setup for the upcoming set Crimson Vow, which is due to prominently feature the vampires of the plane. Many vampiric bloodlines of Innistrad have now instated blood tributes on their citizens. The vampire families, no longer pursued by angels in the Church of Avacyn, are gaining ground on humanity free to maneuver and act with impunity. In the vampire-controlled towns and villages of Stensia, this means a tithe, a tax paid in blood for the protection offered by the vampires, and a guarantee they won't end up as their next victim. The blood tithe is mentioned in the reprint of Vampire Interloper, whose flavor text reads, The Voldaren have begun demanding blood offerings from the villagers in their territory. Their agents arrive from the sky to collect the ceremonial bulls in eerie silence. With the card Stromkirk Blood Thief, we see that not even the humans of Nephalia are safe from the tithes, which Runo and House Stromkirk have begun in stating to emulate the Voldaren. The text reads, With House Voldaren Ascendant, some members of the Stromkirk line 
took it upon themselves to borrow from the blood tithes. Finally, we see the tithe illustrated in the card Blood Tithe Collector, where a vampire noble has approached a hamlet and demands payment from the villagers dwelling within. This is no doubt setting up for the events of Crimson Val, and it seems Olivia Voldaren and her bloodline are poised to stand on top. But we'll just have to wait and see. Overall, I'd say Midnight Hunt captured some of the essence of the original Innistrad block. It had some great throwbacks to past sets, and many new cards that helped lay the foundation for the current situation. The plane has experienced harrowing years in the recent past, with the loss of its symbol of hope and its fight against interdimensional horrors. We get both an aura of rebuilding, a return to the old ways, but also a grim horizon with an uncertain future for the denizens of light on a plane harassed by darkness. Thanks for watching and listening to the first episode of Finding Flavor. I hope you enjoyed our lore-driven breakdown and review of Midnight Hunt. There are some great pieces of flavor in this set, and I'm sure many will enjoy getting their hands on it. But now I want to hear from you. Let me know your review of Midnight Hunt. Did it hit or miss the mark? Let me know if there are any cards I missed that you think have great bits of flavor, which cards you're most excited to see printed, as well as suggestions for future videos in the comments below. And now, I want to give a special thanks to my Patreon supporters that are helping grow and improve the channel. The patronage is much appreciated. Shout out to Alex Joaquim for the intro and outro music. Links to the podcast and Patreon can be found in the description. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.